Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Friday, February 9th, 2018. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My last night of overnights, I'm so excited. Uh, although then I come home and get about five hours sleep and go work at my next job. So, ugh, I'm close to the end here, so I'm <laughs> pretty excited. Hopefully I can hold up. Anyway, let's have a look at a few things going on these days that show us where we are on a biblical timeline. Out of Prophecy News Watch, headline says, Gender Identity Invades the Church, Diocese Bans Masculine Language for God. Now, when people start changing the Word of God to suit their own opinions or to keep from offending people, there's a problem, okay? First of all, the Bible says that God will curse those who add to or take away from his word. All the cursings of this book will be upon those who do so. The latest clash between feminism and the church centers around the grammatical gender of God himself with the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C. voting to ban the use of masculine pronouns when referring to God. I'm sorry. Jesus called him God the Father. He's spoken of as he, him, in several different passages. I'm sorry if it offends you, but be offended. You changing the word of God offends me. These feminists who don't want to think of God as a man, or a he, or a him, or a father try to change God's word to suit their own agenda. That's a problem. Jesus never once refers to God as God the mother or she. Not once. Nowhere. I say get over your ignorance. Get over your insecurity. And stop trying to change God's word to suit your own opinion or your own agenda, because that's wrong. So tired of these snowflakes who are so offended at every little thing. Guess what? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, these three are one. 1 John 5 verse 7 tells us, Not once is God referred to as a woman. So deal with that. Ah. <sighs> All these people who want to change everything. Oh, change any homosexuality sins in the Bible so we can live in homosexuality and not feel bad about it when reading the Bible. You know, Arabs have the Arabic Bible where it takes out any reference as Jesus being the Son of God or the Messiah of the world or God in human flesh because that offends them. Everyone wants to just change the word to suit themselves. That's not how it works. Maybe it's time to change yourself from within to line up with God's word. How about make the changes where they're due? It starts in your own heart, not in God's word. Out of Haaretz, Israel seeks to divert Palestinian funds for terrorists to Jewish settlers. This bill, sponsored by the Defense Ministry, would reduce Israel's tax transfers to the Palestinian Authority by the amount the Palestinian Authority spends on payments to terrorists and their families. So Israel is basically saying, yeah, we're not going to give the Palestinians money so they can then turn around and pay terrorists who kill Jews. Sorry, not going to do that. Seems like so many people are offended. You know what? Jesus even told us this would happen. I mean, so it shouldn't surprise us that we see it happening, just like Jesus said. I mean, in Matthew 24, um, Matthew 24, right down there in verse 10, this is Jesus talking. He said, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. We're seeing a lot of this. We're seeing a lot of people offended by the very word of God. Left and right, they're offended. 
Oprah's offended that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but by me. People are offended by God's word. People are offended by those of us speaking the truth of God's word. People are offended when you say, Jesus is the only name under heaven by which you must be saved. You see, people want everyone to be right. People want all roads to lead to God. People want God to be whoever you want him to be. It's not how it is. I'm sorry. You don't get to put God in a box. God is who he said he is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not, and he cannot lie. Jesus Christ is truth, and he's the only way to God the Father. He said so himself. If that offends you, you have a problem. God's word doesn't have a problem. If it offends you that Jesus called God the Father, then you have a problem. God's word has no problem. God's word is perfect. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's truth. And if anything in God's word offends you, you need to re-examine your beliefs. You need to take a look within yourself. Don't try to change God's word to make it more pleasing to you. Interesting times we're living in. Out of the times of Israel, Prime Minister blocks settlement and annexation bill from coming to vote. Benjamin Netanyahu wants to coordinate the measure with the White House first, but bill will still be debated by coalition leaders in their own meeting slated for Sunday. They're aiming, this bill is aiming to annex Israeli settlements in the West Bank. Interesting. I say it's long overdue. Judea and Samaria should be under Israeli authority and Israeli control. It's going to happen. Don't know how long and at what point, but it will happen. Out of alarabia.net, Iranian Ayatollah's visit to Israel-Lebanon border with Hezbollah causes uproar. Picture has surfaced showing a famous Iran, Iranian Ayatollah, who is also a member of Iran's Assembly of Experts and is expected to be Ali Khomeini's successor, visited the border between Israel and southern Lebanon on a military tour. In this picture, he's surrounded by Hezbollah military commanders and Iranian officers. It was taken during his visit to Lebanon last week and published by the Jerusalem Post, who didn't give any other information about the visit. Interesting. Iran is trying to build military bases in Syria and in Lebanon, surrounding Israel with those who seek her destruction which is exactly what Psalm 83 speaks of. So many things all coming together even now. It seems that Bible prophecy just jumps out of the news pages at us every single day. You know, there's a time to speak up. There's a time to be silent. There's a time for love. There's a time for hate. There's a time for war. There's a time for peace. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us these things. The Bible tells us there's a time to be silent. There's a time to speak. I think it's important <laughs> that we know the difference. I mean, sometimes silence is the best response, just like Jesus did right there when they were persecuting him in Matthew 12, verses 18 through 21. He could have spoken up. He could have called in angels from heaven. He could have prevented himself from going to the cross, but he knew that was the best, best path. It was God's plan. Now, while silence is golden and may be good at some times, there's also times when we need to choose our words wisely and carefully. You know, when we speak, we ought to do so with grace, seasoned with salt, and knowing how to answer each one, Colossians 4, 6 tells us. Grace considers others' feelings. Grace, seasoned with salt. You know, salt adds a little humor, a little, a little punch, a little extra emphasis to our words. And the knowledge of how to answer will help keep us from 
making mistakes with our mouths. I think as humans, we all need to learn um, when to speak, when to be quiet. We learn by being taught as well as by trial and error, uh, on-the-job training, this thing called life. All of us have spoken out a turn or have said something we wish we could take back or we said something that needed to be forgiven. So we need to be forgiving of others who have not yet learned how to hold their tongue or to speak with wisdom. You know, those moments when we have the little slip of the lip and we say the wrong thing, most of the time that costs us in one way or another, especially words spoken without thinking to your mate. I know there's many times I've paid for days about something I said incorrectly. <laughs> um, and you know, these, these can be serious mistakes, but not as serious as if we speak out of turn in our relationship with God. Not as serious as saying things like God's word needs to change because I'm offended at what it says. Um, standing before God, I think silence is the best answer, as Job learned in Job 38, verse 2. In our walk with God, in our relationship with God the Father, we need to know that before him we should be silent, Zechariah 2, verse 13. But Jesus also taught us how to speak to God, Matthew 6, verse 9. He also caused the, the curtain to be torn in two so we can boldly come before the throne of God with our prayers, with our petitions. We need to serve Christ with confidence. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 6, it says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. The Apostle Paul, he wrote these words to his young friend Timothy while he was in prison, while he was waiting to be killed while he was awaiting his own execution. Right here with great clarity, with extreme boldness, with incredible strength of character, Paul communicates he's about to die, saying, the time of my departure has come. Departure. Like he's leaving on a trip. Departure. It's, it's an interesting choice of words. In the original Greek, it has several different meanings, one of which describes being a prisoner being set free from prison. Paul is saying to his friends, as well as to you and I, that, hey, I'm about to be set free from this prison of life. He's looking forward with anticipation to being set free from the restraints of this world, from the chains that bind him, being in the presence of the Lord and receiving a crown of righteousness. You see, Paul could look forward to heaven. He could look forward to seeing Jesus Christ with anticipation. He had the confidence that comes from having loved and served the Lord with joy, from knowing the truth, because that truth does set you free. One day you and I are going to depart from this world, and we're going to meet Jesus Christ face to face. Do you look forward to that moment with joy and confidence? Or is it something you dread? I think if you know Christ as Lord and Savior, that's the thing that gives you great hope. Knowing that you're going to get to stand before the one who died to save you. I can't wait to just hug him. We need to give Jesus all that we are. We need to give him all that we have to serve him fully and never look back and not worry about all these people that get offended when we speak the truth of Christ.
We need to serve with confidence. It comes from knowing that Christ is in you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We can tell others about the love of Christ. We can tell others about his grace, about his mercy, about his incredible blood that cleanses us from all sin, about the saving power that only comes from Jesus, and live in true ministry, just like Paul did, knowing that we are here to serve. In 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 4, it says, And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? What do you think it means to serve the Lord? What, what does that mean to you when you hear someone say, we need to serve the Lord with gladness? I mean, we know scripture commands us to do this, but I think at times there's a lot of people who just don't know quite what to do or how to serve. You know, a lot of times people think, well, I'm, I'm not well suited for the task. God hasn't gifted me in that way to serve um, or maybe we're so busy with all our crazy schedules and our kids and our jobs and all the duties and responsibilities that finding the time or the strength or even the energy to serve God seems nearly impossible. You see, that's, that's how the devil likes to stop us from serving. He likes to make you think, oh, you're too busy for this. You don't quite have the gifts or the talents or the abilities to serve God in any way whatsoever anyway. So you might as well just serve yourself. You know, instead of looking at ministry through this lens of a bunch of obstacles blocking our path, look what God says about it in his word. You know, true service isn't something that we do for the Lord, but something he does through us. You know, this, this pattern was set for us by Jesus Christ himself, who said, the Father abiding in me does his works, John 14, 10. The apostles' lives also showed that this is what God had in mind. When Jesus gave them the commandment to be his witnesses, he said to wait until they were clothed with power from on high. Luke 24, verse 49. You know, when we regard service as God's work through us, then we can have confidence. N not in our own selves or in our own abilities or talents or gifts, but confidence in God who makes us adequate for whatever he gives us to do. God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. Okay. Um, this kind of perspective will also keep us from taking any credit for what we accomplish. It keeps us from being full of pride and arrogance, thinking in some way, shape, or form, we did this. It helps keep us humble. It helps keep our feet on the ground. You know, with God's direction and the Holy Spirit guiding us and empowering us, our service is worthless in God's eyes, no matter how productive it might look from a human standpoint. Unless we have the Holy Spirit guiding us and filling us and leading us, we can do nothing on our own accord. What makes us an effective servant of Christ is not some kind of natural abilities or some kind of insane creativity or any of our human emotions or initiatives, but it's only through complete and total dependence on him for direction and guidance and wisdom. You know, God uses those who are weak. God uses those who are humble, who are submissive and obedient so that he alone gets the glory. I'm not here 
to take any glory that belongs to God. I'm here to give him all the glory. I'm here to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm here to let others know that there is a way to God and his name is Jesus. You need to actively choose to serve. In Matthew 26, 51, and behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. I think in another passage, this tells us this was Peter. Peter, very much just like you and I in many ways. In Romans chapter 1, Paul calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. Out of the six or so Greek words for servant that's used in the New Testament, Paul used the one that had the most connotations to being a slave. The word used in this passage is doulos and comes from the root word deo, which means bind. Paul literally speaks of himself as a a bondman or a slave of Jesus Christ, a slave by free choice, yet owned and fully purchased by Jesus Christ himself. You know, this idea of being a a slave by choice comes from the Old Testament, Uh, like Exodus 21 verses 2 through 6, or Deuteronomy 15, starting in about verse 12. If an Israelite bought a Hebrew slave, he had to set him free in the seventh year. But if the slave loved his master and said, I will not go away from thee, then a hole was bored through the ear, uh, through the lobe of his ear, pronouncing him a bond slave forever. Jesus is the supreme example of, of selflessness. He put others ahead of himself on a daily basis, every time. We can clearly see from the perfect example that Jesus set that the way to exaltation in God's kingdom comes through humility and service to others. I mean, the humility of Jesus displayed, first of all, in him coming to earth taking on the form of a servant is an amazing example of humility. It's also an example to all believers of what greatness in God's kingdom looks like. We need to take this example from Christ, this attitude of the heart, and continue to motivate real believers in Jesus Christ. Continue to motivate true believers in Jesus Christ. The creator became the creation. The Lord became the servant. The most high became the lowest. All of this was done because of God's great love for us. Because Jesus loves you so much that he laid down his life to save you. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And then that's exactly what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us, his friends. I don't know about you guys, but I intend to serve my Lord and Savior all the days of my life. As long as there's breath in these lungs that God gives me, I will use it to proclaim his name. I will use it to tell others about my Savior. And I will use it to to offend as many people as possible with the truth of God's word. Listen, take the message to your work, to your school, to your community. Offend as many as possible with the truth of God's word. Yes, many will be offended, but many will also be saved. And that's what we do. We're here to serve. We're here to serve the one who saved us by leading the lost to the cross of Christ. That's what we do. Listen, you guys have a great weekend. Go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. And good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday.